it's just possible we've got him in time, it's going to be really tough though. On this week's Bondi Vet Top 5. Try 15. It is not something that you want to find and when you do, there's not much that we can do about it. And now he's in a state where I can't even guarantee that he's going to get better and they must be absolutely terrified. Good boy. There, look, Benelli here. Scott and many other general practice vets regularly refer patients to the college to handle specialised cases. Today, little Bob is scheduled for open heart surgery with Professor Dan Brockman. Hello there, Mrs Cunningham. Yeah. Nice Hi, to yeah. meet you. All right, nice to see you. How are you doing, Bob? I think it was really the quality of Bob's life that made me decide to put Bob through this operation. Um, he's getting increasingly um, laboured with his breathing. Just huffing a little bit, isn't Yeah, he, he is Let's a little bit, Let's get him into yeah. the consulting room. Okay, all right, great, thank you. It's not really much of a life for a dog because we can't take him down the park, he can't play with other dogs. It, it was time to get that sorted. Yeah, you don't mind the vet. For Bob's cardiac surgeon, it's going to be another challenging day. The objective of uh, this operation is to try and turn his heart back into uh, a normal heart so that he has not only a normal quality of life, but hopefully a normal life expectancy exactly, as well. Exactly, yeah. Nice long life, Bob. Yeah? The condition that Bob has is called tetralogy of fallow. He has a hole between the left side and the right side of his heart. And because he has a hole between the two, he's constantly getting a mixture of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood pumping around his circulation. So his body thinks that he hasn't got enough oxygen, and it's true, he doesn't. But I'm afraid none of it comes with a guarantee. If we don't do anything for him, unfortunately, his blood will get like treacle, and it won't be able to go through his... Uh, blood vessels and so it's fair to say that this is a very high risk. Doing nothing is very high risk too. He's got a condition that is going to kill him. I have bought some stuff with me for him if that's okay. all right. I'll just go through what we've got. We've got your duck. It's your favourite... Oh dear. No. Your favourite toilet. To make things even harder, Bob is Georgina's first puppy. Here we go. Come on then. And you're going to keep your blankie with you, yeah? They may have only been together for three months but the terrier is already a big part of her life. Excuse me, come on, lad. There we go. We close that up. The Bob size bag, eh? Leaving Bob here today is really stressful. I haven't been without Bob since we've got him because we've had to take care of him so closely. We've become very close. And uh, so it, it's going to be really strange um, letting him go and letting somebody else take care of him. Good luck, Bob. You're going to be fine, aren't you, eh? You get your lucky collar and you're going to be a champion, Bob, OK? You take good care. We'll be waiting for that call, um, I think, which is going to be obviously the most worrying part of it and the scariest part, so I'm going to try not to think about it. Thank you very much. I'll thank talk you. To you. Take later. good care of him, yeah. won't you? Thank you. Will do. Bye, Bob. Good boy. Bye bye, Bob. OK, everyone, this is Bob. He's a Lakeland Terrier that's five months old, and during this operation we've got to open his heart, close the hole in his heart, and open up the blood flow so that his lungs can get more blood. At the RVC, cardiac surgeon Dan Brockman is about to start the open heart surgery, which he hopes will save the life of five-month-old puppy Bob. We're ready to make a start? OK, cutting. Second clamp coming off. And let's go on bypass and call to 28, please. With the puppy's blood diverted through a bypass machine, the medical team can now start plugging the hole between Bob's left and right ventricles with a Gore-Tex disc. Are you OK on that side? Mm -hmm. A second patch will then be sewn over the right ventricle... Scissors again, please. ..in order to improve the blood flow to Bob's lungs and get his blood pressure to a safe level. I've put the heart back in the chest. Hopefully the heart will start to look a better colour now. The open heart part of the operation has been completed now. Uh, we're in a very tricky phase and so I'm a bit nervous in that we've done what we set out to do, but he's by no means out of the woods yet, so we can't afford to lose focus yet. That's a bit worrying because his pressure's falling. Yeah. 
The medical team is desperately trying to wean Bob off the bypass machine. And you've got blood and plasma still going in? Yeah, plasma, yes. But the puppy's blood pressure is dropping dangerously. So I think we try to make his blood pressure better. It's a bit of a last-ditch effort. Hang on just a second. Are we going to be giving plasma while cannulas are in? At the Royal Veterinary College, cardiac surgeon Dan Brockman and his medical team have finished the open-heart surgery on five-month-old terrier Bob. And you've got blood and plasma still going in? Yeah, plasma, yes. But just as they are attempting to wean the puppy off the bypass machine, Bob's blood pressure is plummeting. It's a bit of a last-ditch effort. We're very concerned now that it might be that what we've done hasn't actually helped him. A mean of 50 now. Bob's condition is rapidly deteriorating. Is it stopped again? His heart has gone into fatal arrhythmia. Clear. The team are now trying to shock the puppy's heart back into life. No. Try 50. No. Give him one more shot at 50. Clear. Nothing. That's it, fellas. It's devastating. I mean, the whole team puts so much effort into this, and we all do it because we want to give dogs like Bob a chance. And I suppose the only comfort is that without us, he would have had no chance at all. Having done this for nearly 30 years, I can say you never get used to losing patience. It's a bitter blow for all of us. Thank you very much, everyone. This way. Let's try our first walk. Good boy. On the south coast in Worthing, Georgina now has a new companion to help cope with her grief. Good boy, Rocky. Come on. It's been three weeks since she lost her first puppy, Bob, after complications during his open heart surgery. Good boy. We've got Rocky now in our lives, so it's mixed emotions because we're still really sad about Bob. Um, we have his teddy at home, we have his collar and things like that. Yeah, look, poor little Bob, he couldn't go for a walk, could he? But you and me, we're going to have a good go today. We're going to go and have a look at, the, look at the park, see if we can see some birds, find some squirrels. And what a lovely day for it, eh? Isn't it beautiful, eh? We really miss Bob. I really miss Bob. But Rocky, uh, we're finding already, is really going to help us sort of come to terms with losing Bob and, and really give us the, the little family unit and uh, the future that we wanted. Here we go. Here we go. Hold on. Yeah, he's a good lad. Sarah, can we get two 10 mil syringes of, real, of warm saline, please? Um, he's, just, he's very cold, he's very dehydrated, and he just looks as though he's in a bit of shock as well. At the Bondi Clinic, a heartbreaking emergency has just arrived. This tiny joey was found on the side of a road with no mother inside. The leg muscle here. That's just going to try and give his system a bit of a kickstart. Uh, it's a cortisone based drug, so it, I guess, improves the circulation, just gets everything revved up because right now his system's just crashing. Okay. Yeah, that's nice and warm. Okay, Mummy's milk. If we go too fast, then that milk drips down the back of his throat and he's too weak really to, to close off his larynx, then that milk goes straight into his lungs. And if that happens, then it's going to be fatal. You just can't be impatient with it. Leah from Sydney Wildlife rushed the baby Eastern Grey kangaroo into the clinic. He hasn't been fed properly for three days. And normally in the pouch, he'd be continuously getting nutrients, having warmth from his mother. So I don't, I don't think it's very good. The family who first found the abandoned Joey fed him cow's milk for three days. They thought they were doing the right thing. Cow's milk is really not suited to them at all. It's got lactose. Now, lactose is a sugar that kangaroos just can't digest. 
another 12 hours? No chance. But it's just possible we've got him in time. It's going to be really tough though. I'd say what's happening is that the warm blood's actually just pooling in his body. Yeah. It's not getting right around. Absolutely. So a bit of a massage okay. might actually help. Hey matey, wake up. Wake up. A defenceless Joey found Whoa. abandoned on the side of a road is fighting for survival at open. the Bondi yeah. Clinic. I mean, it looks silly, but what that's doing is actually compressing the blood that's contained within his organs. OK. And we're trying to circulate that right around. And get a six pack. He doesn't as well. seem to mind it, yeah. <laughs> But he seems more responsive. He is much more responsive, isn't he? He's sitting up now. He have ridiculously long legs, though. Have you <laughs> noticed that? I think you do. Aww. I'll have to think of a name for him. He came in a beanie, and I think beanie somehow suits him. And also, beanies are very Australian too, and he is as Australian as they come. A little battler, a little Aussie battler. Not that got it. <laughs> yes, now that's the ticket. Mm. Right on. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Double nods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. More of the good stuff. <laughs> there are some good signs, but Beanie is still critical. After a feed, Sarah wraps the yeah. little Rube back in his Beanie for some much needed sleep. I'm impressed the way he's come through the first six hours, but really the next 24 hours decides whether he has a future. He's basically had to grow up before his time. And it's up to him and it's up to us to see if he can actually survive that. He's got the fight of his life right now. Come on, Beanie. Let's go on. Chris is taking Beanie home so the abandoned Joey can get the constant attention he needs. He's got the seat warmer on. Oh, that's pretty good for Beanie right now. The sick Roo will need a bottle feed every three hours if he has any chance of surviving. I think we might have got off to a very rocky start. Fresh. Feed and change time, come on. What I'm doing right now is actually just covering him in, in lanolin. It serves two purposes. One, it moisturises his skin, but also it provides a bit of insulation to him. Well done. Doesn't look the best, but still, well done. He just looks like some sort of alien. Look at his long legs. It's been a real struggle, but I've just I've managed to find the perfect drinking position for him. And he seems to prefer being quite upright. If you do squeeze his hand back, he seems to really enjoy that and actually start drinking quite feverishly. And you can see now, he's drained that bottle. The man's got a thirst. You can hear these little squeaking sounds. But thankfully, I've got his eyes covered so he can't see the monstrosity that has become his mother. Okay, Beanie. I know from past experience that even though I'm meant to be getting up every three or four hours, it's not like that. Yeah, up on high for you. You don't get up, feed them, go back to bed then get up again three hours later. You get up, fingers crossed, go and check that they're still alive, feed them, then go back to bed, but then you don't sleep. And it's just that constant nagging doubt and nagging worry the whole way through the night that they're actually not gonna make it through the night. <laughs> He's really guzzling it down, big time. It's 1am and Chris has woken up to give Beanie, the orphan Joey, another feed. But this time when Chris unwraps his little mate, there's no movement, no sound. The hard thing is that when he first came in, he looked for all the world like he wasn't going to make it and we, we beat that last night for him to be drinking well and, and, and sitting up and so you think in your, in your back of your mind, hey, this one's going to make it, you know, this, this one will turn it all around and then, and then you get that shock and that sucks, it really sucks. It's 
spent the whole rest of the morning just analysing, you know, was he too hot? Was he too cold? Did I give him too much milk, too little milk? Where did I go wrong? No. At the Bondi Clinic, Chris breaks the sad news about Beanie. Oh, I'm sorry. You can't beat yourself up about it. You know, again, hindsight's a fine thing. We can only do what we did. We put him on heat, we fed him, we gave him lots of love as well, and that's just as important with these young animals. You can just do the best you can. Look, some you win, some you lose. And we found that a lot with wildlife. If you make it, it's great. If you don't, then, you know, that's when we cry. What's this? Come on, what's this? In a nearby park in Richmond, Another one of Scott's patients, five-month-old Vince, is struggling to enjoy playtime with his owners. Come on, good boy, come on. Vince is Karina and Gaz's first pet, but they're extremely worried. Come on, good boy. The little French bulldog isn't thriving or behaving like an energetic young pup. Vince doesn't have those puppy-like mannerisms. He's very, very lethargic. We struggled to take him out for mm. walks and he he's just... Like, he's like a little old man, really. He means the absolute world. And people say that when you don't have a dog, you, they say, you know, your life will change and it's that unconditional love. You've had this little puppy for five months, out of my whole life, just five months. Nobody can explain to you how much you love your dog until you actually have one. It's part of the family, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Karina and Gaz are so concerned about Vince's lethargic behaviour, they've booked him in for an appointment with Scott. It's like, it's like our number one priority at the moment, you know, to get him better and... Yeah. Um... So we think it's time to go and sort the little man out. We can't imagine life without him, can we? No. Not at all. <laughs> Little cutie. In Hatfield, north of London, little five-month-old Vince is so unwell that Scott has referred him directly to the Royal Veterinary College for testing. Not too sure at the moment kind of what's going on. We'll be fine. We're really worried, but hopefully we'll be able to get to the bottom of it today. Hi. Hi. Hi, Rebecca. Hi. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Karina. Nice <gasps> and this must be Vince. <laughs> Hello. 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 Dr. Rebecca Geddes will be oh, investigating Vince's case. Hello. Should we go through to a consult room? Come on in. What is your main concern about Vince at the moment? What's the reason that you've come here today? I think it's probably his weight. Like, he's obviously very skinny at the back. He's not putting any weight on. Yeah. Um, it's also yeah. his temperament. He just... Obviously, he's only five months, so he doesn't have that kind of excitable energy that most puppies have. A lot of people have stopped us and asked if he's an older dog. He sleeps a lot, like a hell of a lot. When we see puppies like this who aren't growing normally, we sometimes call that failure to thrive. There are a lot of different possible reasons for that. Some of them are hormonal problems and can be anything as varied as an internal organ that isn't working very well, through to being born with a problem where the metabolism doesn't work. So there's really a lot of possibilities on the table. Where I would suggest we start is with some blood tests. And then I think also doing some imaging would be a good idea. And then it'll be a case of putting all of those results together to decide where to move next with his investigation. Perfect. Thank you. If you just give it one little last hug for now and I'll pop him through. Oh. Hi, buddy. <laughs> I want to get lipstick on you. <laughs> Be fine. I think it's just the unknown of it is I just wish I knew instantly. Yeah. So that we could just make him all better. Good boy. Well done, Vince. 
Good weekend. boy, you were so good. Well done. Dad. Just giving him some sedation. What we're going to do is essentially take a 3D X-ray of Vince. Pretty much going to do the whole of Vince just to see if we can find anything that might be contributing to him not putting weight on very well. So this is Vince's CT, um, and his tongue in here is really, really, really big. Ah, oh, okay. Um, so this is quite enlarged. And also his joints from his jaw, basically, they're angled in a very strange orientation. And then there's another little finding on the very back of the dog. So here in his muscles, in the thigh, very back, yep. there's some area that is a little bit mineralized. Oh, um, and okay. there may also be muscle um, that is affected. So he probably has okay. something wrong with his musculature, but in general, not just in his head, it's but okay. throughout the whole body. So we've got thickening of the tongue and thickening of the diaphragm and some other muscle changes. So what we want to do next is investigate the muscles further by doing what we call an EMG, where we'll look at the electrical activity in the muscles. A normal muscle should just, at rest, be silent. We should have a nice flat line, but instead we're seeing a lot of kind of up and down and you hear that really loud kind of aeroplane sound. That is completely abnormal and tells me that we've probably got a serious muscle problem going on. Hi, Karina, do you want to come yeah. through? <sighs> so I've had Vince looked at by a number of different people. Mm -hmm. Neurology, I've been having a look at him and um, we've got some blood test results and the results of the CT scan. Yeah. When we look through his body, there are some changes that we can find. So mm -hmm. there's a muscle in his back leg that's got a little bit of mineralization, okay. a bit of a change in the muscle. Yeah. From his blood test, there's also something called CK that we can measure that is like an enzyme that comes from the muscle. Right. And his CK is really, really high. Normal is up to about 400. His is 37,000. So okay. it's massively yeah. elevated and that's another sign to me that his muscles aren't right, working okay. as we would expect them to. It does make me worried that we might have something more like muscular dystrophy or something like that going okay. on. Right. Um, something like that would be really quite a devastating diagnosis for him. Um, because it, it may be something that we couldn't do anything about for him. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I'm so sorry. That's okay. <laughs> but this is something really uncommon, really rare. Does that mean a shorter life? Most probably. Okay. A lot shorter life, yeah, yeah. Vince will be kept at the RVC overnight for further testing, and then Karina plans to visit Scott to discuss the final diagnosis. We could be looking at a condition that will be life-limiting and that won't give Vince a good quality of life. A week after the visit to the RVC with her beloved pup Vince, Hello. Karina Hello. is back Hello. to see Scott. Sadly, tests confirmed Vince has an incurable muscle condition. Scott's downstairs if you want to oh, go straight you. down. Vince is suffering with a condition akin to muscular dystrophy in people, which is basically where all of his muscles are wasting away, they are becoming mineralized, so they become hard, and they lose their function. So his tongue is solid, his swallowing muscles are weak, his muscles across his whole delicate frame are just wasting away in front of us. So it is not something that you want to find, and when you do, there's not much that we can do about it. To see that in a puppy that's six months old is, uh, is heartbreaking. You know, our hearts are all broken for you guys because I just don't know how this must feel, mm -hmm. you know. How are you guys going? 
Um, he's still our little man, so we just love him no matter what. We have seen a big difference. Very lethargic a lot of the time. Yeah. It isn't normal and he has lost his spark. This is just not a disease that we diagnose in dogs regularly. It's a highly irregular, very rare condition. And in all honesty, I've never seen it in the full 20 years that I've been a vet. A time will come mm. where you and Gaz and I feel that he's not enjoying himself mm -hmm. and his quality of life deteriorates. Yeah. And he deteriorates to a point where not being able to get up, not being able to enjoy your company, mm. not being able to go to the toilet with dignity, mm. you know, just not enjoying life. Okay. But unfortunately, it is going to be weeks, I think. Okay. Okay. <laughs> No. He's just such a baby. You little man. <laughs> so all we can do is just make him feel so loved. Sadly, just days later, Vince lost his brave battle. Vince was a heartbreaking case uh, to be diagnosed with muscular dystrophy, a wasting disease in such a young puppy. And, you know, Karina and Gaz are so brave and so wonderful and, you know, you can see their hearts breaking and there's nothing you can do. So it's, uh, yeah, just a really hard one to, to get over, really. Yeah, very difficult. Hmm, one of the hardest in my career. At the Bondi Referral Hospital SASH, Four-year-old golden retriever Fatty has been rushed in for emergency treatment. All right, he's had a bag of fluids. Oh, bag of fluids. Okay. Yeah. All right. Fatty was running in the park with his owner when he suddenly collapsed. His legs started to shake, and then he just dropped. So I thought he must be tired, you know, very tired. So I started to pour water on him. Then he started to crawl, <laughs> and I saw his back legs not moving. Then I, I. I know there's something wrong. Heart rate's 140. Got clear lung sounds. Normal gut sounds. Oh, God. Massive diarrhea. His body temperature is sky high. He's panting. He can't walk. He's got diarrhea. He is a mess. Owners said that he, they were running him. It was a hot day, so it could be something like heat stroke. Yeah. Dogs are much more prone to heat stroke than people are. We sweat through our skin, whereas they sweat through their foot pads and nose and rely more on panting to keep themselves cool. Now, on a hot day when the humidity is high, that is just not enough. Fatty's temperature is alarmingly high, almost 43 degrees. A normal body temperature for a dog is roughly 37 and a half up to 39. But to have a body temperature of nearly 43 degrees, now that's enough to cause damage in every organ in the body and cause the brain and blood clotting system to shut down. That's a boy. You're a good boy. Yeah, you are a good boy. He's all tucked up in bed. Fatty's distressed owners, Nick and Stephanie, are anxious to see their sick boy. I feel so bad for Nick and his family to see Fatty so unwell when this morning he was completely normal and all they were doing was taking him for a lovely run in the sun and now he's in a state where I can't even guarantee that he's going to get better and they must be absolutely terrified. So it's good he's aware you're here and, and he's looking around. He's just body has had such a knock, so um, we just got to now try and get him better, okay? This is really hard for Nick and his family because they love Fatty so much and now he's in a hospital in a critical state and they don't even know if they're going to see him at the end of the day. Cross your fingers, but you're giving him the best possible chance, okay? You're doing everything, everything that I've recommended you're doing and that's the best thing for him, so, okay? Okay. All right, we'll keep you updated. I'll give you a call in a few hours and let you know how yeah. he's going, okay? All right. Thank you. The next few hours are critical. 
Because heat stroke can cause multiple organ failure, um, doing some blood tests to work out what's going on inside fatty. At almost 43 degrees, Fatty's body temperature was dangerously high. It looks like Fatty's results are pretty good considering his body temperature was so high. These are actually not too bad at all. I'm actually quite surprised. I was expecting his clotting times to be off the scales and abnormalities in lots of his internal organs, but everything's actually looking pretty okay at the moment. This is a little bit promising. Even though it can change, I'm going to hold on to this as something good. You're nice and cosy there. We're going to get you feeling a lot better, sweetness. Right? You're a good boy. You're a good boy. So. Well, this is pretty strong, I guess. Yeah, he looks like he's having some partial seizures, but you're OK. All right. He's having a little seizure there. At SASH, heatstroke patient Fatty has suddenly taken a turn for the worse. Okay. Not bad. Heatstroke affects every part of the body, so when the body temperature goes above, say, 42 degrees, it can cause brain damage, and I think that's what we're dealing with right now. So we're going to give him some anticonvulsants to try and get these seizures under control, but, but this is really not a good sign. And can we get an ETCO2 monitor on him as well, please? Yep. He's really not breathing on his own. We finally got Fatty's seizure under control, and the next minute I notice his breathing becomes shallow, and he stops breathing, and then his heart stops. <laughs> I've got no heartbeat. Can we get some adrenaline, please? Yeah. And before we know it, we're performing CPR on him. I've got it. I've got a heart rate. Did you feel it? Yeah. Yep. Yep, there's a heartbeat. Lisa and the team have brought Fatty back to life, but he's only just hanging on. I'm feeling sick about this. This, this is a real turn for the worse. It's not something that I expected to happen so quickly, but to me, it shows that Fatty's systems are shutting down, and I don't know if he's going to pull through this. Nicholas, hi, it's Lisa, the vet speaking. Fatty's owners are anxious to hear of any developments. So Lisa is now phoning them to discuss treatment. So you're happy for him to be put onto the ventilator? OK, all right, so we'll put him on a ventilator and we'll keep giving him the medication and we'll give you an update in an hour or so. So he said as long as there's a chance, he'll give him a chance. It's pretty amazing. Fatty survived a cardiac arrest. Now, not many animals get through that. And now he's on a ventilator and he's in a coma and yes, his chances of survival are low, but it just gives me a little bit of hope that he's going to pull through this as well. Oh, good boy. Don't you give up. No. Mum and Dad and your family are really, really waiting for you to go home. OK? Daddy? I'm through. At SASH, heatstroke patient Fatty is now breathing with the help of a ventilator and his worried family has come back in to see him. Look, I think we have to take it an hour at a time. Yeah, so I guess we just wait and see. Yeah. Wasn't even that hot today, was it? <laughs> I feel so bad for Fatty's family. They were just trying to be good owners by exercising their dog and Fatty was playing along and didn't realise that he was getting so hot at the time and everything went downhill from then. And they don't even know that they're tired, they don't even know they're hot, they just want to chase and play and feel hot but they don't complain about it and, and then it's often too late. So don't, don't feel bad, we see it all the time. But he's getting everything, you're giving him every possible chance. Slim, slim chance. Fatty is so lucky that he's got a family that is so committed to him. They absolutely adore him and they have decided that they want us to do everything that we can. They are holding on to every possible chance that there is and I hope that he pulls through for them. Take care. It's going to be a long night. We've got Fatty on a ventilator. We're treating him with medication for his blood pressure. We're doing everything we possibly can, and the rest is just up to him. I just hope like hell that he pulls through this. Don't you give up, buddy.
that sash, it's been an incredibly tough night for Lisa and the emergency team. Fatty's blood tests just got worse and worse. His organs continued to shut down. In the early hours of the morning, four-year-old golden retriever Fatty sadly lost his brave battle for life. You know, this is just a heart-wrenching reminder to me and everyone around that heat stroke in dogs can be deadly. It is the hardest part of my job when this kind of thing happens. And we've done everything in our power to get Fatty through this. And his owners have given us every opportunity to try and help him. And unfortunately, this is just a situation where medicine is not enough. In Richmond, one of Scott's long-term patients is enjoying a few quiet cuddles with devoted owner, Sarah. Badger is our 12 and a half year old Irish Wheaton Terrier that we've had since he was about six months old and he's been the best dog we could have ever wished for. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't find him dressed as a witch or a fairy or a, you know, he's just been an amazing part of the family. But Badger's been battling a massive low-level malignant tumour. Sore, isn't it? And despite two major surgeries, it keeps growing back. So we're sort of worried that if it isn't addressed, it's going to split the skin because it really is stretched. And it's like, sort of, it goes all the way underneath, sort of almost like a sort of tennis ball size and then this bit at the underneath. So it's, it's pretty grotesque. We sort of promised ourselves that we wouldn't operate again. Scott's done both operations previously and um, we kind of drew a line under it and went, right, that's, we're done. We're not going to do that again. But it's sort of got bigger and bigger and, you know, he's relatively happy in every other way and we're now kind of like back in the situation of, what do we do? Badge, do you want to go for a walk, Keith? Yeah. Oh, come on, Bella. Oh. Come on, boys. Good boy. We've got to go and see Scotty. OK? Come on. Good boy. I've got to get you up the hill. Okay. As Sarah heads in to see Scott, she's bracing herself boy, for the possibility on. that Badger will need a third surgery. Come on, then. Let's do it. That's a good boy. Hi, Kirsty. Hi, Sarah. How are you? All right, here we are again. Oh, hello, Badger. How's he doing? All right. Yeah, he's doing OK, but, you know, the lump's really big now, so oh, I think... See, um, can't you? Yeah, I think it's okay. kind of decision time, so... Another chat with Scott. Oh, oh do you want to take a seat? Yes. He'll be right with you. Just say you know you're here. Thanks, love. All right. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Scott. Hello, Badger. How, How are you, mate? You are right? You're a very happy boy today. Goodness me. I can see why you've come in. Yeah, it's, it's not slowing down. It is not. It's quite monstrous at the moment, isn't it, mate? All right, all right, yes. all right. Yes. Right, oh, right. is that a bit tender? Come oh, here. Bless you. Come on, let's keep, this, let's keep the happy happy boy, <laughs> eh? <laughs> the waggy tail's what we want. Come on then, Badge, you're going to come this way? Come to the consult room? Come on. Good boy. Good boy. Well done. Good lad, didn't you come? There we go. Well done. So, it's been a few weeks since we've seen each other and unfortunately that has grown, hasn't it? Yeah, it's definitely, um, it's not slowing down. No. And how's he being affected by it, do you think? Well, I think slowing down, <laughs> he's, um, you know, he's not as inclined to sort of go for a walk as much as he was. You can tell it's just really cumbersome and it's awkward. He's finding it hard to find a comfortable spot to sit down. This is a massive tumour that's really pulling his weight off to one side, which will be affecting his balance, will be causing an increase in arthritic development in the back legs. There's a lot of negatives to this thing, besides the fact that it's stretching the muscles that it surrounds and causing him discomfort. He still wags his tail whenever anyone goes near him. He still wants to go for a walk, albeit a short one. So I feel like we're doing him an injustice if we just leave it. OK, well, but let's... It's it's a very hard decision, really. It is, it is, and we flip-flop about it constantly whenever we see each other, don't we? This is not the first time that we've considered removing Badger's tumour. It's a slow-growing sarcoma, which is a malignant type of tumour, but it's one that doesn't tend to spread. It just continues to regrow in the same site. Now, unfortunately, 
the size of this tumour and where it is means that we can't ever remove it completely. So unfortunately, it keeps growing back and this is now the third time that's happened. So I think what we might have to do is just pop a muzzle on him. All right, champ, it's Hannibal Lecter time. Yeah, come here, bud. Come on. So he's a gentleman until he's challenged and then yeah. he turns into a bit of a, a bit of a beast. Yes. <laughs> don't you, mate? Hey? No, you just know your own mind, don't you? Yes. OK, you ready, Sarah? I'm going to pop him up. Do you want me to lift or you? No, we'll go. Oh, good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Wow. This tumour is absolutely huge. Sort of see it coming out from his chest. It's almost like he's got an udder, isn't it? Like, it's just... It's like a, a cricket ball, isn't yeah. it? And, and it's sort of that hard as well. Yeah, it's huge. There's positives and negatives. Yeah. But I think the thing is, is that he is a lovely, otherwise healthy family dog. Yeah. Except for this. So if I can rid him of this one last time and give him the, you know, old age, genteel life in Richmond that he deserves, well, I think he deserves it. Yeah. Yeah. The worst thing would be for him to not come through surgery. I think, I, you know, we haven't got a choice now. He's just, you know, he's in too much discomfort. I think we've got to do it. So, um, yeah, I am worried. Cheerio, Boise. Be good. Come through it. OK. All right, All right thank okay. you. OK, love to you and the family. See you later. All right, bye. see ya. Bye. Okay. Say bye, Mummy. Say bye. <laughs> oh, I know. You've got to be such a brave boy. Yes, you do. Hi, team. Hey, hey, you're on. Hey, yes, so. Badge is back, Nath. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he says with a worried look in his eye. <laughs> He's a really sweet dog, but just not the best patient. Agreed. Hence the muzzle. Reagan, I don't know if you've met Badger. No, I have not. That is crazy. Yeah, it's not his most attractive feature, is it, champ? No. Unfortunately, I'd love to say that this is the first time we've removed it, but it's actually our third. Oh, really? Yeah, it's uh, a slow-growing sarcoma. It doesn't actually spread anywhere else in his body, but just continues to want to live on this side of his chest. And you can just think how taut. It's so tight, you can feel it. Yeah. And so it's stretching all those muscles, and that's what's so uncomfortable. That's why you're panting all the time, aren't you, mate? Because you're just a little bit low-level uncomfortable all the time. Oh. So this time, third time lucky. Look how vascular it is as well. With Badger's fur shaved off, the huge scar from his two previous surgeries is clearly visible. Right, here we go. It's the line Scott is using to go in for a third time. It has some semblance of being fatty, but it's granular. It just doesn't have any structure. I mean, once you get your finger, I mean, it just, it's just soft. Going in to remove this tumour, it is just hideous. It's just everything that you think would personify cancer. It has no structure to it. It pulls out like kind of wet porridge. There's a lot of blood supply to it as well. It's just huge and it's just horrible. The nasty tumour is especially confronting for Scott's new nurse, Reagan. No, I didn't expect it to be... Well, I don't really know what I was expecting, but not... Not this. Not this. No. No, no not quite. Yeah. 20 minutes into the surgery, Scott is becoming increasingly concerned. Badger's actually losing quite a bit of blood removing this because it's just so vascular. It's uh, within all the muscle layers of the chest and we can't control it because the blood vessels are... That there's no rhyme or reason to them. They're not growing in the normal way. So I'm just doing my best to be... to remove as much of the tissue as quick as possible. But it's uh, a little bit nerve-wracking at the moment. After 25 minutes, Scott has removed as much of the tumour as he can safely manage. I'm just going to... I'm going to pull out, close it up. It's just, I've got as much out as I can. But suddenly... Have you got a heartbeat? Badger's condition starts to deteriorate. Okay. Oh, yeah, I have got, got one. It's not very strong. Yeah, I just need to keep a very close eye on that. OK, just have a listen that he's definitely, definitely got a pulse still. Bragan, put your hand underneath and feel the femoral pulse. I'm not sure if I'm feeling Can you get, just get James across? Yeah, yeah just go, 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 run into the pump, start the sauce, James. 
Badger's tumor removal surgery has now turned into an emergency, with Badger's condition rapidly deteriorating. Can you just put your arm up there and just, just have a feel for a pulse? Scott has called in vet James to assist. You can't feel the pulse? All hands on deck. I still am in a situation where I'm sterile, trying to complete the surgery because we can't stop the anaesthetic until I've closed this massive wound. So it does mean that I am hogtied. I can't use my hands, so I need my colleague James to come in and help with the CPR. He's taking a breath. That's a breath in. Yes. Yeah. All right, the breathing is the really important thing, so just keep on breathing for him. Don't stop. I put him on two and just see how it goes. Yep. Have you got a heartbeat? Can you hear? I can, uh, yeah, I have got, got one. It's not very strong. Is that him then? Let's yeah. throw some adrenaline at him. Same dose. Precious minutes are ticking by. But now, Badger is not responding. Can you feel anything? I can't hear anything. No adrenaline now? Yeah. Anything? Badger has now been unresponsive for over six minutes. And Scott is forced to make an agonizing decision. Okay. Okay, I'm just gonna call it, guys. Good work, everyone. Okay. It's one of those things. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's surgery still. Yeah, you can't really. Can't leave it the way it was. No. I think the looks on everyone's faces, I think, says it all. Everyone's completely gutted, and especially Scott. Scott now has to make a heartbreaking phone call. Hello. Oh, hi, Sarah. Uh -huh. Hi, um, Scott here. Hi, Scott. Hiya. Um, yeah, I haven't got good news for you, I'm afraid, Sarah. Yeah, he's, he passed away on the table, I'm afraid. Oh, my God. Oh, what happened? Tell me. I got probably two-thirds of the tumour out um, and uh, was just sort of cleaning up the edges before closing. He stopped breathing, and this time we couldn't get him back. Oh, Lord. I just was so sure he was going to come through the surgery. So, so, did, so did I. That's why I just, I'm like... I'm so sorry, Sarah. Yeah, she's uh, she's devastated, as you would imagine. Um, straight away as a parent, she's thinking about the kids and thinking about the fact that she decided not to tell them before the surgery, thinking that they would worry. And so now, obviously, they're gonna be so heartbroken that they didn't get a chance to say goodbye, which is just... You know, thinking about my kids and thinking about that happening to my dog, it would be very hard. So it's a, it's a bad, bad day. Yeah. Sorry, mate. If you guys loved that video, great. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel below. That way.